to the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. Dr. Steve Wood here in Omaha, Nebraska, College World Series edition with Bill Kanaski. Omaha, baby, downtown at the Hilton. And uh, we are going to the College World Series today. Just gave a fantastic CLE at the Dvorak Law Firm here in uh, Omaha, and they're throwing a big shindig uh, right next to the um, right next to the stadium. Very exciting! I'm looking forward to it. I'm starving. I gotta I gotta eat. So I'm gonna start with my rant before uh, we talk a little bit about the College World Series, and then viewer mail. Today's viewer mail day. Um, okay, that's the, you and I have not discussed this rant. This is this is I'm just throwing the, this on you for a Yes, and I'm dying to hear if you've been through this, but I just lost my mind the other week. So I've it's happened three cities in a row. Okay. Go to a restaurant and I get the menu. I order an eight ounce filet. Filet comes out. Steve, there's no way it's eight ounces. It's five. It's five and a half at best. I didn't see anything, right? Okay. Then yeah, then travel the next city, order the salmon. Salmon comes out. It looks like a mini, looks like a baby salmon. I, I mean, and it says it's supposed to be 10 ounces it's it's maybe four or five at best and then the final straw i'm at, I'm at the uh i'm at love field in dallas and i order the three egg omelet for breakfast steve it comes out and it's it's not three you know what a three egg, big, i mean yeah. a three egg omelet it's pretty big, yeah and i just i lost my mind and i i grabbed the server and i went this is not a three egg omelet he's like do you want to talk to the manager i'm like i think i do Manager comes over and I'm like, dude, I go, you're charging me $17.95 and this is not a three egg omelet. You know, you know what the manager says? He goes, yeah, I know. My boss told me to tell the cook to only make them two eggs. This is right when the like inflation. There yeah, is. Yeah. So everybody's worried about inflation. I'm like, but your your menu says three and the steak menu said, you know, uh, eight ounces and the fish menu. I I have noticed this cutting back of portion sizes. Have you ever experienced this yet? Uh, it's making me crazy. I, I guess on the on chicken wings, I've noticed. You well, know, chicken you, wings, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're paying what twenty one dollars for five six yeah, wings. Exactly. Unless but, you go to, I was in um, <laughs> Minnesota, and I ordered wings, and they gave me like twenty four of them, which was an obnoxious amount too. So yeah, I thought I didn't think you're going to make it back from that trip. No. <laughs> But I'm just saying this, this, I, I get the inflation, but here's the thing, Steve, if, if it says eight ounce, uh, uh, filet, I expect an eight ounce filet, not, no. not a five or six. This no. is bullshit. Is this pre-cooked though? Eight ounces or is it, I mean, Steve, I'm I know sorry. what an eight ounce state looks like. Whose side are you on here? I, I'm just asking. I'm just playing devil's advocate. It, here. Uh, what, uh, it says on the menu, eight ounces. What, what do you, what do you, do you tell me it cooks down to five? I don't know. I don't think an eight ounce steak cooks down to five. No, I, I don't think that's. A, I don't think I can do that though. Yeah, I don't think so. So I'm saying I'm very bent out of shape over this, and everywhere I go now, I'm just watching what like what is on the menu versus what's actually being delivered. But when I caught the guy at Love Field, and I'm like, this is there's no way this is a three egg omelet. He's like, yeah, you're right. We were told to cut it down. I'm like, don't. But why why are you charging me? He's like, we just raised the price too. So I go, let me get this straight. I'm paying seventeen ninety five. For a two egg omelet, he's like, "Yeah, I'll take twenty percent off of that." I'm like, "Now wait a second, twenty percent? I go, you're kind of ripping me off by thirty three percent, aren't you? It's a, supposed to be a three egg omelet. I'm getting two. Doesn't sound like a twenty percent discount to me." So I got down the. I, I, I lost my mind. All right. You're, are you a fan from Love Field now? <laughs> no, I'm not banned from Love Field. Um, College World Series. Uh, fan, I, I will say this: I was here yesterday. Fantastic. Uh, atmosphere a must do put on your bucket list um fantastic people uh the stadium's beautiful um these lsu fans are out of their minds they travel very very heavy yes but uh um the gator fan the gator fans traveled well everybody traveled well i was very uh very very pleased and uh, we we're going to the game i think i think the high temp is 94 and we're behind home plate in the sun that's going to be interesting I hope somebody has sunscreen, um, but we, we're going to go there like right after this podcast. So let's get this underway. Um, let's go to viewer mail. Uh, Steve, uh, so I'm going to interview you here. I'm just going to throw these. I'll let you go first. Uh, how will AI change the legal industry? Who's going to benefit the most, plaintiffs or defendants? 
Oof. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things we've been seeing a lot, right? This is it's going to be interesting to see how this kind of rolls out in the next even year or so with the yeah, is it a year is it five years is it 10 yeah. years i don't know i don't know i think there's been some everybody's been kind of cautiously optimistic about <laughs> what it's going to do and what it's not going to be able to do um but who's it going to benefit the most i mean i think it, i would probably say at least i would say the plaintiff's perspective because they want to be efficient right exactly they're, they're only getting paid if they win so exactly they, they want to be efficient whereas if you're a defense attorney billing by the hour i have a podcast i, I have a panel podcast coming up with three attorneys uh coming up uh later this uh or next month uh but yeah i mean if if you're if you're billing hourly and ai can i don't know, do half of your stuff you know in the the snap of a finger that, that could be a problem for defense attorneys yeah i could see that definitely i mean i think one of the things the only the drawback and i think that stuff a lot of that what comes up with the discussion about ai is you know, you, you still can't remove the human component, though. Yeah. So there still has to be some level of human component Definitely. to it, whether that be client management or whether that be any sort of other uh, type of interaction with with witnesses and with all of that that you're going to need from from an actual human being versus just a computer. Absolutely. Is it freezing in here? Is it just it's me? very. Okay, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dying in here, man. It's like sixty six degrees in here. It's going to be ninety six degrees outside. Um, all right. That covers AI. Uh, question number two. Uh, I got this the other week. I saved it. Are all nuclear verdict juries angry? How do I spot angry jurors in voir dire? Um, Steve, we know that not all of these jurors are angry. Uh, no, no, they're, they're not. I mean, so that's a hard no, as far as to the, to your first portion is collecting as... data on this too. Yeah. And we've taken a peek at it. Yep. Currently looking at it. I mean, yeah. Is there some relationship between anger and nuclear verdicts? Yes. Is it the sole cause? And is it the driving factor? I would say no, because how many times have we seen jurors who are very calm, very calculated, very involved? They're eager. They're eager. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're happy. They want, they, they think they're doing something really positive. They're yeah. not, they're not there with, uh, you know, torches and pitchforks. They're, they're, they're talking uh, in a very motivated, eager way. And, they think that they're doing something really positive. Um, I now I've seen some angry jurors. Yeah. The vast majority of them, I, I don't think that's the case. No, I don't. I don't think so either. Like <laughs> that hasn't been my experience. And then as far as how to spot them, obviously, you know, I'll let you kind of talk a little bit about the idea of state anger versus trait anger. But yeah, two types thing. of anger here. And so the so if you're looking for angry jurors. Um, so you're looking for trait anger, meaning science is kind of predisposed to be angry. <laughs> people that already run in the red, people that are kind of grumpy and they're they're, they're angry at everything. They're just angry, miserable people. Um, those should be fairly easy to spot by the you know, their tone, their body language, <laughs> uh, their posture, um, and how they answer for dear questions. You're going to see if somebody kind of is pre-wired to be angry uh, as they start talking. But state anger is anger in a certain state. So these are people that may appear calm. Uh, well, with, with no anger issues in Bordier, but they may get angry during the trial based on things that they're seeing. So you can't really prevent that. Um, so I think the key uh, with Bordier is to assess these folks um, on again on their tone, on their body language, on their facial expression. You know how emotional do they get when they're talking about um, uh, and when you're giving them open ended questions? How emotional are they getting? Are they getting aggravated in Bordier? That'll tip you off to trait uh anxiety but state anxiety these jurors are getting angry during the trial um and that's something i don't really think you can spot and so um i, I still think a juror that's very calm uh has a, a really good positive demeanor can get um can get pretty angry if they see the right things at trial agree all right got some background noise here at the hill too yeah. i don't think they they, they understand that uh, we're recording a award-winning podcast. I don't think we're award-winning just yet, but that's okay. Okay, so back to my bitching and moaning about the. Okay, so okay, so here's the the thing that's made me crazy about the College World Series. So I go yesterday. Uh, Florida is playing Oral Roberts. Great fans, and there's fans from the other teams there as well. Do you know how many Kansas City Chiefs shirts and hats I saw yesterday? No, how many? How Steve, many? It, into the fifties. I. It's it's June. It's we're in mid June, and these Kansas City Chiefs fans are already out 
I, I think at, that's an appropriate. What do you baseball think? at baseball games? At baseball yeah, games. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a little at baseball games. They're 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 strutting all the Super Bowl hats, the sweat, the the the, the t shirts, and they're just walking around with their chest out. I I don't I I think that's I think that's insensitive. What do you think? That's I think it's, it's a little it's a little early for that. A little, it is a little it is a little early. Yeah. They're still. Yeah, I mean, I guess they're still living it up. For... A guy was in a Mahomes jersey yesterday. A Mahomes jersey at the at the College World Series. I mean, I get it, Chiefs fans, and and you earned it. I understand, but you have to wear that stuff to the College World Series. Everybody's got to know. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's making me nuts. Okay, back to it because we're gonna we're rattling off this podcast because we're gonna go to the game. Uh, who wait? Who's playing? Stanford, Tennessee. That's yeah. going to be a good one. And the yeah. is the elimination game. Maybe. Yes, it is. And that'll be excellent. Um, how do I deal with the witness who has multiple personal issues going on? She cannot focus during witness prep. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Been down this road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest things is you have to address, <laughs> try to help with those personal <laughs> issues in the first place, because obviously to try to, do any sort of witness training and try to get them prepared for the deposition without addressing yeah. any of the other aspects that are going on. I think you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. So you got to almost spend time and just focus on that prior to. Yeah. I had a witness recently who um, was having significant marriage problems. Uh, one of her parents has Alzheimer's and the other one has a different chronic illness. So she's trying to care give and um, <clears throat> just so that the weight of the world. And so um, I did recommend um, that she look into some, you know, some therapy yeah. uh, to, for, for help on that. And she did say that she was going to some therapy. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I asked her how often she's going. She said every two to three weeks. And I recommended, well, you know, maybe you, know, you got a deposition coming up. This is another stressor. <laughs> maybe, maybe go every week up until, um, uh, up until this step, uh, get more support. And we talked about things like exercise, eating behavior, uh, deep breathing exercises, things she could do to, you know, reduce anxiety <laughs> um, and uh, worked a couple of days with her and uh, she came out really well. And the thing is, I think, yeah, oh, here's the thing. You want to know why I knew she had multiple uh, personal issues going on, Steve? What was that? Because I asked. Yeah. <laughs> I asked. I well, remember well, we thought we had a whole podcast about this, but witness assessment. Ask these people, okay, this is going to be a stressful process. You're about to be deposed. Do you have a trial coming up? What other things? things are going on in your life yeah right? and you'd be shocked what you hear and people are going through a lot of tough times and maybe it's economically and financially maybe it's emotionally maybe someone in the family's sick i mean it, it's a lot of burden well i think that's one of the things that we bring <clears throat> we bring value to as an outsider perspective i mean how many times have we picked up on or, you know, either if you're not, if you haven't got to a point where you, you've asked, but even to, still during the training sessions, you can pick up on subtle cues, yeah. things that they're saying, comments that they're making that, you know, there's something kind of below the surface. Yeah. If their emotional reactions aren't matching the situation, yeah. you know, there's a problem there, but you got to ask ahead of time. Don't wait for something to just pop up the week of the deposition because you did not ask about it. Question four. Yeah, you've illustrated how damaging pivoting can be during defense witness testimony. Uh, yeah, we have. Oh, yeah. Oh, and our uh, part two of our article is coming out in uh, July in CLM magazine. Great. Uh, why do witnesses have such a deep desire to pivot? And why are yes, no answers so unsatisfying? This, see, this is an emotional issue of how we deal with things in everyday life. And you can pivot around in everyday life and no one gives a shit. Um, I pivoted this morning. You pivoted this morning, right? When, when, okay. So, so Dr. Wood here, so we're about to give the CLE. Dr. Wood gets the coffee mug, puts it in the coffee, very fancy coffee very machine, by the way, hits the Americano button. And w- so what you had an eight ounce cup and a four, 12 ounces of coffee yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> so, warning, nothing. To hit. No warning. So Steve has an overflow of black coffee all over the place. Um, uh, nice, nice recovery though. Thank nice you. recovery. Yeah. So of course he then instructed me to use the larger tall cup, uh, which was uh, for could f- could fit twelve ounces. So I did not have the same fate. Uh, thank you for stepping in there. You're welcome. That's what I do. That, 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 stepping on that landmine for me. Um, but I can tell you this: um, witnesses like to defend. The brain is wired to defend, and it feels good to give somebody else a piece of your mind when they're coming at you. And I think that that's what people want to do. And that's the trap and deposition and trial. They want you to fight back. And 
I have so many witnesses that when we train them you know, to say, yes, that's correct. Particularly on these factual questions, yes, that's correct. Yes, that is true. And then when they get blamed for something to say, no, I disagree. And to do that persistently, how how effective that is for testimony. But know what they say during the break? Like, that's it? That's all I say? Like, mm-hmm. I really want to fight back. Talk about your experiences with witnesses. Like, they want to fire back because it feels emotionally good. But that's the exact trap the plaintiff attorney is setting up for them. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to people <clears throat> wanting to de- defend their conduct, explain themselves. I mean, how many times when when we've done things and people ask, you know, or if, if, if they call you out on the carpet about it, you know, yeah. rather than just say, yeah, I did it, own it and moving on. You feel compelled. Like I said, I had felt compelled to try to uh, explain away why I used the yeah. wrong cup. Um, but point being is, is, like you said, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're getting your side of the story across. But the problem is in a deposition, it's actually opening doors you didn't need to. It's prolonging your deposition. It looks terrible. It looks terrible. Like my cross-examination of you this morning, it was awful when you're trying to pivot. I mean, Steve, isn't it true? I gave you one thing to do, get a cup of coffee, and you blew it. Isn't that true? And you went pivoting, 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 you're you're done. Um, uh, At least only two people saw that. There was, you didn't have a huge audience on that, on that overflow issue. Um, now question number five, uh, do attorneys, well, you're going to love this question, Steve. Mm. I did a whole podcast. Do attorneys welcome you with open arms when you are retained on a case? Oh my God. Uh, it, it depends. I've broken this up in the thirds. Yeah. I've broken this up in the thirds. Okay. And, and disagree. Maybe you have a fourth. I, I think there's three, <laughs> this is defense attorney, right? Three defense attorney kind of profiles. Okay. <laughs> Number one, we have what I will call the winner, the winner, the Mike Bassett's of the world, right? Um, these are defense attorneys that see us as weapons. They fully welcome us. They want to know everything we think. They want to do jury research. They want us to prep witnesses. <laughs> they want every single, they're just, they're obsessed with winning. I like working with these attorneys. I want to work with somebody that's obsessed with winning. I am obsessed with winning. You are obsessed with winning. And I thoroughly enjoy working on those, on those, on those cases. And I work with those attorneys. I, I that's great. I, I'd say that's a third of the of this population. <laughs> the middle group. Um, I'm gonna call them uh, what are we gonna call them? Essentially, they say, Yeah, I'll play along. Yeah, I'll, I'll, like, I, I don't think I really need you. But you know what? The client wants you. Yeah, I'll play a lot. Um, and they smile through the pain, I guess. Now, a lot of the people in the kind of play along uh, group, as we're going to call them, uh, they eventually turn into they love us. Yeah, they, so I was going to say. They turn into the winners. That, that, yeah. And then they want us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so a lot of people in the middle group that say, eh, I don't think this is necessary, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> Excuse me. Because the client wants to. Uh, they become believers, and then they they want us to be on there. So so you can transition from from the middle group to the winning group, and we get and we get those. But these folks just sit there and essentially say, you know, yeah, I'll sit through this. Yeah, um, I'll play along. Client wants it, and then most of them, I think, by the end of the day, they become fans. Yeah, I think a lot of times <clears throat> it's it's kind of the way you know what the perception is and what the thought is about what we're doing and coming in and basically the thought being that we're coming in to take over their job. And I always try to make sure that I try to point it out to your point. Your point is that we're a weapon that we're, we're there to help them and we're there to be part of the team versus come in to say, you sit in the corner and don't say anything while I run the show. It's more or less, Hey, this is a team effort. And I think that's when they finally get that realization, I think is when they start to come around. Yeah. And so we try to win over those groups and they're nice to you. They're yeah. nice to you. They just, you know, they, they usually like the small talk is, you know, I, I typically prep all my witnesses myself. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've done 50 mock trials. Uh, you know, I do that. I do that. So you have to try to win them over. <laughs> so we got the winners, we got the, I'll play along. And then the third group is, is the, I, I would call them the, uh, I don't know. What do you want to call them? Um, Antagonistic. Uh, the, the like my son says, this sucks. This everything sucks. They they think we suck. They, they they're mad at the client. They're mad at us. They don't play nicely. They purposely try to undercut us and torpedo everything we're doing. They disagree with everything we say, and they're just big sore losers. They just don't they don't play along. <laughs> they're not nice. They're offended. 
they're offended and appalled that we have been retained because they think they can do it all themselves. And uh, this is, I want, I tell you, this group is not a third. I, we'll no. break it down in three categories. This is not a third. This, this is like third. 10%. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd say the rest is the other 90%. But this is a category and uh, we're never winning them over. Uh, they don't like us. It's not happening. And it typically, I think, I think it hurts the case. What do you think? I think so. I think so too. I mean, you're, it's, it's only, it's, it's only doing a disservice to the witnesses, which ultimately is a dis- doing a disservice to the case. So it's like the whole idea, right? Where you, you yeah. know, cut your nose off to spite your face yeah. type thing. Yeah. So a uh, defense counsel lighten up. We're here to help. Jeez. All right. Final question. Number six. And then we are going to the college world series. Uh, I need to mock try my case, but I'm un, uh, I'm not sure if certain evidence is going to get in or not. Um, how do I deal with this at the mock? You and I have dealt with this quite a bit. There's a couple of different ways you can do. Yeah. This. I mean, I guess it depends <clears throat> on what, what you mean by, you know, whether it's not going to come in or what, but I mean, if, if it's, if it's evidence that's, you know, you, know, you have a, a motion to eliminate out and you're yeah. not sure if it's coming in, then obviously you, you should do the mock trial assuming that it comes in, you know, but obviously the, the other way to do it that is a more expensive way, but it, you at least get your answers as well as you might try it one way with it in, and then you might try it another way without yeah. it in. And that at least gives you an idea about, you know, because how many times have we seen where people are so worried about this evidence can't come in, this evidence is so damaging to our case. <clears throat> and then you find out when you have it in or you yeah. don't have it in, the outcome's not much difference. So then you realize yeah. it, maybe it's not as, as... And if you don't have the budget, if it's only... If it's only one piece of information, like one or two, I would say you can do the entire mock trial. Then right before deliberations, you cut one group loose, you hold yeah. one more group, yeah. you give them the additional effort, and then you compare results, uh, stuff like that. Okay, but I, think, but I think one of the important things, though, Bill, that you need to understand is the whole idea of, we hear this all the time, too, of, well, let me give it to them at the end during the focus group. doesn't work. Yeah. How would this change your opinion? How If we would have told you this, what would it? It doesn't. It doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We are out of here. We're going to go. I mean, our hotel's directly across the street. Um, I'm going to, okay. What, what's the under over? Uh, okay. Then just for, cause we're only going the first game. So we, we had, let's look at this population here. So like I went, I'm not saying it's going to be fit under over on number of Kansas city uh, chiefs, either hats or shirts that we see today, this afternoon, it's going to be many. I'm just telling you right now, I was exaggerating with the 50, <clears throat> but I'm gonna, I think I'm going to set the line. I'm going to set the line. It's I'm going to set the line at 12 and a half at, at, at 12, at 12 and a half. You're going to, it's at 12 and a half. And I tell you, I'm going over on the 12 and a half. I there, yesterday. I'm just telling you everybody and their brother. I mean, Mahomes jerseys, uh, uh, the hats, the t-shirt, the Super Bowl stuff. It was, it was all over the place. It's, I guess it's, Kansas City, I believe, is three hours from Omaha. Is the word on the street, so I can I can see that. But folks, it's the College Baseball World Series. It's not a college football game. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on the. I'm gonna go on the under. Then. You're gonna go under. I'm gonna go under, and then we'll report back. We'll uh, report back on a on a subsequent. Uh, are we we're putting a wager on this? How about a, how about a twelve ounce cup of coffee and an eight ounce cup? How about that? I like it. That just sounds go. like a great wager. It sounds like a win All for right. everybody. Get us out of here, and then we're gonna go watch Stanford and Tennessee. Well, how about as prediction on the game? Um, I, I know you want to go SCC. I know. I'm um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Stanford. And Stan- Stanford just they had Wake Forest. They had Wake Forest beat, and Wake came back at the very end. And Wake is no joke, by the way. No, no joke. Yeah, very impressive. Um, I think it's an elimination game. Yeah. Um, I know you're going heavy on the volunteers. I think I have to go uh, with the Cardinal. I think I'm going to go to the Stanford Cardinal. They're going to bounce back. They're going to bounce back from the Wake Forest game. And I think uh, I think I think Stanford's advancing today. Mm. Got to go. Like I said, got to got to stick with the SEC. Um, but although Stanford is a good choice, seems how they knocked out Texas A and M twice. Oh, yeah. You know they had to they they, they all A and M had to do was beat them once, and Stanford beat them twice. But hey. That's how they roll in College Station. So Absolutely. All right, get us out of here. All right. This has been another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. See ya.